I would now like to introduce Meg White. Meg works as a flow scientist and ecologist with the Nature Conservancy Science and Water Programs in the state of Colorado and for the Col Colorado River Program. With over 15 years of experience in water, Meg is an interdisciplinary scientist with expertise situated at the intersection of repairing ecology, restoration science, hydrology, landscape ecology, environmental policy, and urban water resources. Welcome, Meg. Thanks, Mary. You bet. You want me just to take it away now? Yeah, it's all okay. yours. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for taking some time out of your lunch. Uh, I'm going to figure out if my computer is responding or not. Looks like I'm sharing my screen. There we go. Excellent. Um, Thank you again for joining us today. I have two of the co-authors in the room with me, and I want to start, uh, I'm hoping to take about 40 minutes to walk through the study that sort of evolved out of a question of uh, a bunch of river rats had as we've studied these systems and even floated these systems and started to recognize that we were seeing points of dynamism at tributary junctions and started to ask some questions about habitat complexity in the riparian corridor and what that could mean for restoration. But before I launch into that, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this without my co-authors. I have uh, three amazing scientists from the Nature Conservancy who worked on this with me, uh, Brian, Teresa, and John. And then Pat uh, Shafroth from the USGS was a partner in this uh, with us, and another woman who is intimately familiar with uh, the Dolores in Colorado in this region, Chris Rasmussen, um, and she worked for USGS as a postdoc for a while and now is her own research ecologist with Eco Mainstream Consulting. So it, it's been a dynamic team, and we've had a lot of fun and challenge in doing this. And I, of course, want to uh, thank the Southern Rockies LCC and BOR WaterSmart for funding this work. Um, just a brief roadmap for today. I'm going to provide a little bit of context on riparian ecosystems and habitat com complexity in the West, just to give some context. And then um, I'm going to read provide an overview of our research questions and hypotheses. It's been a, an interesting exploration that I think, just like any research paper, it sort of ends up taking a little bit more of a circuitous path than one might think. Um, we'll focus on then the methods and, and the analysis that was done in order to bring us to our results, and then finally look at what that means for management and restoration impl implications and how this can be translated into more work moving forward and also translated to work on the ground. So to begin with, you know, we all, I think, are, are familiar with the fact that on a global scale, there have been significant increases in water demand along with shifts in climate that have led to diminishing water supplies. And so that's exacerbated these tensions between the human demands or need for water and what's left in the river to maintain riverine ecosystems and function. Um, more regionally in Colorado and in the southwestern U.S., we definitely have been feeling both the pressure of water stress and water scarcity. And so um, there's been a lot of flow regime that's been highly modified due to, due to management. And um, that continued flow alteration is anticipated. So the question is, how can one move forward trying to conserve and or preserve riverine ecosystems um, or restore riverine ecosystems and their habitat in light of these circumstances? What's the reality look like moving forward? So when we think about trying to balance these, uh, the freshwater demands with the flow dynamics necessary to maintain a healthy river ecosystem, we first think about What's the science behind it, and how can we inform water managers and practitioners on the ground? Um, and so there's this paradigm shift that's surfaced in the ecological literature in sort of the last two decades or so that's essentially said that increasing habitat heterogeneity or complexity will promote the restoration of biodiversity. And this has been shown across a number of different ecosystems and certainly has been examined um, uh, quite a bit in the aquatic components of, an, of the riverine ecosystems. But what has been less explored are the riparian components with this. So first, let me um, define habitat complexity. We have defined it in this work as the extent, number, and diversity of habitat types or cover types within a specific area. 
Um, and it's, again, recognized as being one of the most important factors in structuring biotic assemblages. So we are, of course, premising this work on this assumption that, that complex habitats can promote species coexistence and will lead to greater diverse, diversity and or resilience within a system. Um, but there's still really only a basic understanding of the underlying mechanisms driving the heterogeneity that exists in riparian ecosystems and especially um, in regulated river systems where tributaries uh, introduce a fair bit of dynamism. So the question then remains what we know of habitat complexity with tributaries, is there actually a way to, to, re to recognize or to quantify the patterns in the riparian zone? Um, <clears throat> so if we think again, further about this, what we decided to do is structure our, our study in two regulated systems. We wanted to look at a system where the flow regime was impacted, and we wanted to um, specifically try to answer some questions about tributary influence in those systems. So we initially started out with this notion of riparian habitat complexity, which we then broke down into geomorphic and vegetative complexity as we moved through this study. Um, and the goal of this work was to investigate, again, the role of tributaries in moderating habitat complexity along two sections of regulated rivers on the Dolores and the Colorado. The idea is that habitat complexity in the riparian zone will provide greater surface area, more physical refugia, and higher and more varied supplies of limiting resources. And so therefore, you will see it in both the physical structure and the vegetative response. The question remains, though, how does this translate for riparian ecosystems? Because we do know this for aquatic more clearly. So we have two research questions that's driving the, that we're driving our work. The first was, does riparian habitat diversity change at tributary junctions, or do tributary junctions make a difference? And then if so, how do those patterns change, particularly as they relate to either grain size or scale? So these were the two fundamental questions that we set out to answer um, in exploring this work along these sections of river. And we really only have two hypotheses. The middle, the middle bullet on this is a sort of a specification of the first. So we were hypothesizing first, related to the first question, that riparian habitat complexity, which is measured as geomorphic and vegetative response, it peaks at or just downstream, perhaps immediately upstream too, of tributary junctions. And more specifically, that we would see different, different responses in the physical response versus the vegetative response. So geomorphic complexity would be higher or more varied, closer to those tributary junctions, while the vegetation cover might, the complexity would increase further downstream or further away. And again, you can recognize that these hypotheses are tied strongly into, you know, sort of seminal things like the uh, intermediate disturbance hypothesis. Um, the second hypothesis that was tied more to the pattern piece and scale ha says that we would expect to see some changes, either laterally or longitudinally, um, with, in response. So we would see shifts in patterns and, and that we would be able to detect some of those shifts based on the grain size and or um, differences. Now, what you're going to see is that some of our study was slightly modified from these um, hypotheses, although we fundamentally addressed both of them. So just to review our study area, we worked on two rivers. The Dolores Watershed is the first that I'll go through. Um, it encompasses approximately just shy of 12,000 square kilometers in southwestern Colorado and southeastern Utah. Um, it flows for more than 340 kilometers from high in the San Juan Mountains to its confluence with the Colorado River. However, in 1984, there was a reservoir that was constructed about midway through the Dolores. Uh, it's located about 300 kilometers upstream of the confluence of the Dolores and the Colorado. And so that's drastically reduced flows for that stretch of river downstream from the, the dam. Um, and there's one large tributary, the San Miguel, that feeds into the Dolores. So there's marked difference, and I'll try to use my pointer here, 
in the flows in the upstream from the San Miguel. Uh, there's a drastic reduction in flows, close to 50% reduction has been recorded, while downstream from the San Miguel, which is a major tributary, the flow dynamics have only changed by about 20%. Um, so the geomorphic changes have been therefore smaller downstream, and we identified through our analysis about 103 tributaries in this stretch of the, the Dolores that we could use for our work. Um, one thing to note, we did use NHD as our source of data. We found lots of errors in the NHD data. We, we um, tried to acknowledge those errors and fix them where possible, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The section of the Colorado that we included uh, includes the bottom land around, of about 215, 216 kilometers from the Utah and Colorado border to the confluence with the Green River. We wanted to, we purposefully excluded the Green River tributary from this, um, from this analysis because the Green's watershed is actually quite large and it has a huge influence. Um, the portion of the Colorado River that we included then, excluding the green, was about 67,000, 68,000 square kilometers and included 70 tributaries. BORs reported that the Springs Peak flows in this section because of upstream damming has been reduced by 30 to 40 percent, although because of the tributary input in this section of the Colorado, it still is able to maintain a relatively natural flow variability. So you don't necessarily feel the same kind of damming effect on this system as you would on, some, on a smaller system like the Dolores. Uh, so the larger tributaries like the Green, the Gunnison, and the Dolores, because they're dammed relatively high in their respective watersheds, their effects on the sediment supply, for example, are, are slightly dampened. Okay, so our methods. The first thing that we did was to um, we wanted to ex examine the potential influence of the tributaries on the complexity, so we classified both fluvial features and vegetation cover um, using remotely sensed imagery. And once the classification was complete, we examined uh, riparian and geomorphic patterns in two dimensions. One, we looked at the, we initially looked at it laterally, examining the entire bottom one width, and then also the near channel environment and the wetted channels. And then two, we looked at it longitudinally, and we'll talk about this in a second too, with measures taken at 10, 25, and 100 meter intervals. We used supervised image classification, created a two meter resolution map of the primary vegetation community and land cover types. Um, and our mapped classes included some anthropogenic classes, two of them, vegetation classes, there were five, and then bare ground water and shadow. So you can see in the key in the bottom how some of those look, and this is a, these are a couple of different images from both the Dolores and the Colorado, um, just to show what that, what that vegetation cl classification looks like. Now, we, this was a big part of our effort, um, trying to maintain a certain level of accuracy and to, to be able to do something with remotely sensed imagery so that we weren't hand classifying all of the vegetation. and so. To eliminate potential errors, we aggregated patches smaller than 16 square meters into to cover classes. So 16 square meters represents our minimum mapping unit, or the smallest area of the classes delineated on the map. So that's essentially our pixel size. And our overall classification accuracies ended up being 70 and 78 percent for the Colorado and Dolores Rivers, respectively, which we were pretty happy with. The other thing that we needed to do was, was again, do the fluvial surfaces or, or map the channel types. Now, because of a, a number of different factors, we ended up hand classifying these channel types. One of our co-authors took the time. Um, she'd already done it for the Colorado River, and so she took the time to do so for the, um, the Dolores. And we classified six channel classes based on their geomorphic characteristics. Those channel classes are more accurately represented in this image. Here, primary channel, secondary channel, isolated pools, backwaters, and split flows. In this particular image that I've selected for this presentation, only four of those six types show. Um, and you can see that <laughs> some of them are quite small. Oops. 
with the yellow areas and this, this magenta over here. Um, so we defined, we had to, with this, we needed to define the wetted area, we needed to define the near channel environment, and then also the bottom land. So we define near channel environments as 20 meters of the edge of the D Dolores low flow channel and 100 meters of the edge of the Colorado low flow channel. Those represent the average width of the low flow channels for the two rivers. So that's how we came up with that buffer. Uh, we mapped the bottomland boundary by visually interpreting the bottomland and upland uh, surface interface and delineating the extent of the current fluvial activity. And we constructed then the boundary using vegetation, topographic, and hydrologic in indicators. Now, all of this was done using NAEP imagery and mapped channel classes. So we used that to identify as many features as we could. We also had to account for challenges like shadows in the imagery, which, which meant that there were sections of the river, particularly on the Dolores, that we had to eliminate from our analysis. Uh, to identify tributary junctions for this work, we extracted flow lines um, and corresponded those to tributaries and converted each flow line to a point located at the terminus that was proximal to the channel center line. So essentially we tried to create a geometry, as it were, out of the, the tributaries coming in. What we were able to discover in this was that uh, there were many errors in the NHD as far as not lining up with the NH NAEP imagery. So we noted all these inaccuracies, adjusted nearly all the locations of the tributary junctions based on visual comparisons, and then used those in our analysis. Okay, so again, there was a lot of data back work with all of this. Um, one of the, the coolest methods that, frankly, Brian brought to the table in this was uh, using these and polygons. So these and polygons ultimately became our, our sample unit for this. So beginning at the upstream end of, uh, of the study area, we systematically placed points at three intervals, and this was, along, this was longitudinally. Um, at the 10, 25, and 100 meter intervals to capture patterns at increasing grain sizes around tributary junctions. So this was a way to sort of get its scale, but really it was ultimately about changing the size of the unit that we were um, attempting to analyze. We did this longitudinally, but we also then uh, were able to use those lateral differences, the entire bottom land, the near channel environment, and the wetted channel we could remove in order to do some of our analysis and compare laterally across the floodplain. Um, for each point, uh, the, so a thesis and polygon is sort of defined here, um, and we treated these thesis and polygons as our spatial analysis or sampling units to quantify the habitat measures. We had, you know, gone down several different roads with different kinds of data, and this ultimately ended up being one of the cleanest ways to be able to work on both of the rivers um, and answer our question. So the data analysis, the way that it works, we took the Thiessen polygons, which created a continuous spatial uh, series of habitat measures, and those included five different response variables or habitat measures, if you think about it. Um, bare ground, so the percentage of bare ground, the, the percentage of tall woody, which we uh, clearly tried to delineate and, and differentiate from sh shrubby, more shrubby vegetation. Uh, cover class richness with all the other vegetation types, channel class richness density, and then the combination of the cover and channel class richness. The last group ended up being um, a little too muddied, so it's really only the first four response variables that we ended up using for this output. Um, the tributaries that were included in this, so we did, we moved through this iteratively. We included all tributaries initially just to see what would happen with the patterns. And then we started to change the amount of buffering around the tributaries so we could isolate the responses. And we came up with uh, a two kilometer buffer, a kilometer upstream and downstream seems to be the best for isolating response and really being able to tie patterns to a specific tributary. Following this, uh, we then um, decided to conduct a petite test or a change point analysis. We didn't expect the values for the habitat measures to change smoothly along the longitudinal profiles. So we used the petite test to identify the discontinuities in the series for each habitat measure. And, and we did this across all scales for both rivers. What a change point test does 
is it detects a single location where there's a shift in the relative magnitude of the habitat values. So for example, where bare ground percentage is greater upstream than downstream of that change point. That's the question that it's answering, asking and answering. We use the change point to split habitat measure series into subseries, and then we were able to detect change points with that. And I do have a slide on this, but I've hidden it for now, so if people want to see it at the end, I can show you what that looks like. Um, so again, we conducted the change point test for the entire bottomland and then the defined near channel environment at the three different scales, 10, 25, and 100 meters. It allowed us to identify where distributions for each habitat variable changed for each river, regardless of tributary presence. So it got us halfway there to one of our questions because we could see where change was happening or shifts were happening in the patterns for the vegetation cover or the channel types but we didn't necessarily know if that was affiliated with a tributary. So that, what, that, what we then were able to do from that is move forward into a randomization test. And we, a randomization test helps to evaluate that hypothesis that change points represent some sort of pattern um, by answering or asking the question that change points for habitat measures were closer to tributary junctions than would be expected by chance alone. So if we didn't find any sort of significance in the randomization test, then there was no pattern that was detectable from the change point test. Uh, we accomplished this by randomly selecting points along the river, calculating the distance from each point to the nearest tributary junction, and determining the average distance selected across all points. Then we, of course, it's sort of a bootstrapping method. The number of iterations exceeded the guidance of 5,000, so we tested to our alpha of 0 0.05. That was our significance level. And once the change points were identified, the, the randomization test allowed us to quantify whether the change points were more closely associated with tributaries than would be expected by chance. We did only run the randomization test on the near channel environment, um, and that was simply to try to capture or emphasize the influence of tributary junctions. Um, and then we analyzed a subset Again, it was a subset of those that were, that were represented by this two-kilometer buffer. So let me walk you through the results if you're not confused enough. So um, the first is uh, the randomization test of our p-values. This is sort of showing our results for, uh, so essentially we've run the change point and now we're, we're running the randomization test on those change points to see if there's any significance. And there are some significance uh, values that have surfaced for both systems. Um, on the Colorado River, change, point, change points for cover class, channel classes, and bare ground were all more closely associated with tributaries than would be expected by chance at the 10-meter scale, and then density of channel classes also surfaced at the 25-meter scale. So again, remember, this is sort of the, the sampling unit trying to, trying to understand how big of a footprint can we actually detect change, or is there a footprint that's too big? And then on the Dolores River, there was only one significant, uh, one, one finding of significance, and that was at the 25 meter scale for tall trees. Now, one thing I'll note about the tall trees is that on the Colorado River and in this section of the Colorado River, there were so few tall trees that it became a little bit of a moot point for that system. Um, to translate, that into numbers that uh, might mean something a bit more on the ground, especially for managers. What this looks like is that we were able to identify that most of the significant change points that were occurring, regardless of scale, were occurring below the threshold of 1,200 meters away from a tributary. So there was a significant shift that was occurring um, less than 1,200 meters from a tributary Junction. So this was a little bit of a threshold response. So what this allows us to do is sort of identify that zone of influence of a tributary on average across these, across these uh, river systems. It's not exactly on average, but we're not taking into account a lot of the tributary characteristics. So look at these then uh, as sort of interpretations of box and whisker plots. And to note again, I'm showing you some that are significant uh, statistically and some that are not, but most of these are not. We took them out to about a 1,600 meter distance just to see if there was any additional uh, variation that ex extended 
further downstream than that. And on the Colorado River, you can see that for the cover class richness, we have a, a, a pretty clear increase, again, up to about 300 meters away on average on the Colorado River. And we also see an increase that's occurring around that 1,200 meter mark, which is just of note, it's nothing that we interpreted aside from noticing these patterns on this. And again, I will note if you see these box and whiskers, there's nothing that's statistically significant. These are ecologically interpret ecological interpretations. Um, and I'll see if my co-authors need to protect anything. Um, on the channel classes for the Colorado River, what we noticed was that closer to tributary junctions, we had a lot of geomorphic diversity. And then we saw a pretty significant decrease in that, and then it sort of maintained. So it did seem to be, to be that, um, that there was a lot of, um, of diversity closer to the tributary junctions, as we had hypothesized. Now, the x-axis on this, let me do this before I forget, the distance bins, what these mean is that we've got, so we've got these different spatial sampling units that were at 10, 25, and 100 meters. And then we have these distance bins, which are simply breaking up the distance from the tributaries. Now, these distances are not from a single tributary. It is what's happening within 100 meters of all tributaries that we sampled, what's happening within 200 meters, from 100 meters to 200 meters. So that's the way to read this. And it can be an upstream and or downstream effect, typically more downstream than upstream. Also with the Colorado, and again, these three that I happen to uh, to be using are the ones that were significant as far as the pseudo p-values. Um, the Colorado River, the bare ground, was also one that cor correlated somewhat with uh, the slide before with channel class diversity and density. So with bare ground, we did see more bare ground near tributary junctions on the Colorado. Uh, and then you saw, you can see a little bit of a drop off, but it is a little all over the place after that. And again, none of these are um, are really showing strong spatial patterns or statistical patterns. On the Dolores River, the cover classes, this is one that um, does not necessarily show any strong pattern. I wanted to, to include one variable that simply is showing you some of the variety of data. We did have a slight increase uh, between that 100 and 300 mark in, in cover class density, but largely it sort of stayed high after that, and it was, again, a slight uh, increase. For Woody Tall, this is the one that showed up as um, significant, and these are with the appropriate spatial sampling units. So uh, the Woody Tall distance bin shows you that there was a lot on the Dolores River, again, where we could actually detect what was going on with taller trees like cottonwood. We were able to see uh, higher cottonwood recruitment and or cohorts closer to the tributaries, and then we saw a pretty significant decline with increasing distance from the tributaries, right around that 300 mark. And then again with bare ground, this is a little bit all over the place, but we do see higher bare ground um, closer to the tributaries. We see an increase right around, sort of a decrease around 400, an increase around 500, and then it's a little all over the place. So nothing um, that can be strongly interpreted based on this bare ground. And again, the bare ground, this was at the 25 meter scale, the others were at um, a 100 meter scale. And then there were three on the Colorado that were at the 10 meter scale. So the question is, what does all of this mean? What can we take away from, from any of this? Um, first and foremost, the, the, one of the key take, takeaways is that there are patterns that can be detected and that scale does in fact matter, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, the tributary effects on all the response variables along the Colorado River appear to occur within 500 meters of tributary confluences. Um, terrestrial cover complexity seems like it increases at, uh, up to about 200 meters away and then it declines. And complexity, channel complexity is, is higher nearest the tributary com uh, confluences and then declines fairly steeply uh, within the first 300 meters. Um, bare ground are, is higher at confluences, and then it drops gradually within that first 500 meter realm again. For the Dolores, distances greater than 500 meters from the confluence may add more insight 
to patterns in terrestrial cover and percentages of tall woody cover in particular for this. So the differences in the two system sizes seems to be making a difference here. Um, there were some ways that they, they differed, um, and some of the differences point to the flow variability and the size of the system. So for example, the size of the bottom land, which I haven't really spoken to. Um, contrasting dynamics to are, are things that drive patterns in riparian habitat complexity. So on something like um, the Dolores, where you've got a really significantly impacted flow regime, you're, you're simplifying the system and you're seeing more of that simplification. Whereas on the Colorado, because more of its natural flow variability is, is intact, you are seeing um, less of, somewhat less of an influence at times of the tributaries. So um, what does it mean at the end of the day? Uh, we, based on our hypotheses, increased geomorphic and vegetation complexity in the presence of, of tributary confluences does in fact exist. Uh, there was higher geomorphic complexity closer to tributary junctions, and we saw vegetation or riparian diversity um, increase with distance. And ultimately, one of the, the key findings, and almost by accident in this, was that scale does in fact matter. So you can see that there are shifts in vegetation cover, channel density, bare ground patterns. Those are much more detectable at these narrow lateral, narrower lateral extents so the near channel environments, but riparian forest cover, for example, you need more of a surface area in order to actually be able to detect it, at least with our methodological approach. So we were more strongly able to detect that across the full bottomland environment and really only for the Dolores. And finally, uh, what does this mean for on the ground work? How can we actually translate this to help inform future restoration efforts? First of all, we do know, and it's been proven in the literature, shown again and again, that tributaries deliver critical resource inputs and dynamism on regulated rivers. What this work has shown is that that, those, that, that dynamism can extend well into the riparian zone. Um, it's difficult, uh, as other authors have pointed out, to do sort of um, regulated and large-scale analysis on, on this kind of question around tributaries. Um, the tributaries themselves can serve as refugia, and they might. They, it appears that they provide the geomorphic uh, complexity and potentially the habitat complexity in general to achieve riparian outcomes locally and at larger scales. In other words, if you're an, a natural resources manager trying to figure out how or where you spend your money and efforts, you may use some of the spatial extent from this to determine that tributaries themselves can provide a source of input, but you may want to move further downstream if you're actually looking to establish riparian communities. Um, one thing that this left us with, of course, was more questions than answers. So we know that there are things that we weren't able to investigate in this work. For example, the physical and biological characteristics of the tributary. So for example, how does, is there some correlation with the watershed size that a tributary is uh, coming off of? What about the volume of sediment input or the erodibility of soil? Or how uh, the land use is in that particular watershed for that tributary? And then also the main stem environment. We were able to start to see some patterns that the main, what the main stem is doing, what the receiving system is doing really matters. So the sinuosity within a certain reach, what's the width of the main stem and bottom land to the tributary size, what angle does the tributary enter uh, the, the main stem, and how do you actually analyze that? All of these things will certainly uh, interact to influence riparian response patterns and are questions that still need to be answered. And with that, I want to finish by just thanking, again, our partners and funding in all of this. Um, again, this wouldn't have been op uh, possible without the funding from BOR WaterSmart and the Southern Rockies Landscape Conservation Cooperative, and, uh, and certainly without um, the help of USGS, and, and uh, our team is certainly indebted to, to them for um, all the resources they provided to us for this work. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Meg. Um, 
And uh, for you folks in the audience, um, you can ask Meg and her co-authors questions by either typing them into the chat and sending them to Science Applications, the host, and that's me. Or um, when we're ready, I can, um, I can tell you how to unmute your phone and um, you can ask a question via phone. Um, we have a, right now we have one question in the queue, so I'll go ahead and read it. The first question is, how does the Nature Conservancy propose to use this information in making management decisions or in collaborating with other managers? Basically, you know, how transferable is the information to other confluence and systems? That's the second question from Kevin. Okay. So um, I forgot to mention that this is um, in for review at Landscape Ecology. So hopefully this, this publication will be available to anybody and everybody who wants to read it. We'll hope to make it open access too. But, um, and I think, you know, we had specific partners in mind or people who work on these systems in mind, including uh, organizations like the Tamarisk Coalition when we were designing this work. Um, as far as its, its transferability to other, other systems, I think that what we were trying to account for was if you've got a regulated system uh, in the Western U.S. and you've got tributary confluences, you can potentially apply the same method to any system, regardless of its underlying um, hydrologic regime, and see if those same kinds of patterns hold true across spatial scales. Great. Thanks, Meg. Um, now I'm going to open it up to anybody who would like to ask a question via phone. All you need to do is um, press star 6 to unmute, to unmute yourself. And then uh, when you're done speaking, press star 6 again to mute your phone line. So we'll take a couple seconds here to see if anybody has a question they'd like to ask via phone. I also, I have Teresa and Brian in the room with me. So um, they are our spatial ecologist slash research ecologist, ecologist extraordinaires. So if you just people want to get uh, really technical, I have the resources here. <laughs> And of course, if you don't want to ask a question by phone, feel free to type it in and send it to the host. We'll just give it a little time here. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit for people to formulate questions or to figure out how to unmute their phones. Again, just press star six to unmute your phone. Well, it doesn't look like we um, anybody's um, ready to ask a question by phone. I have not, don't have any other questions in the chat box. Um, do you guys have any? You know, I mean, we could, we do have a little bit of time for more questions. And if you guys, maybe, do you have any other resources that you'd like to relate to the audience that um, might be useful while we wait for a question or two to come in? A good, it's a good question. You know, I think um, we found some, some USGS resources really helpful um, in, in doing this kind of work, and there, there's actually been an entire textbook that's been written speaking to the difficulty of trying to uh, look at, at sort of quantified geomorphic changes along large river systems. And so that is a resource that we've found to be really useful for us because we think of Having that geomorphic surface obviously is laying the foundation then for the vegetative response. And that is um, the Torgerson et al. 2008 um, book. And Brian's looking up the, the exact title because I don't remember it off the top of my head. Christian was nice enough. He, he did a review of our paper and he was really excited about our work, which was really um, great to hear. Um, But there is, there's a lot. It's you know, it's hard not to be stymied. We were, we 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 were challenged uh, quite a few times in this work, and um, and found ourselves being lucky enough to to get creative and um, and sort of dig deep to find some answers, which has been a lot of fun as a team. I think a couple questions did come in, so while you guys are looking that up, um, I'm going to go ahead and field these questions. 
Uh, this is from uh, this is from David. Okay. You had mentioned something else you had about the Thielsen polygon analysis. Can you show us that? Oh sure. This is so. This is the change point slide, and I just had it hidden. But this is so. So this is the step that comes after you've identified those polygons. Or it's actually a little separate from. Um, on hide. So this is what uh, a change point analysis might look like as an output. Now this wasn't actually. This was an iteration of our change point analysis when we were approaching things a little differently. But what you can see is that the red dots. Um, as you run that change point analysis or that petite test, those red dots are what are showing as being significant. There's some sort of significant shift in whatever variable that you're looking at, either upstream or downstream from that from that point. So um, those you can see in this initial run of it, we had fewer change points that were surfacing, which was one of the problems that we we uh, with one of our initial approaches, we had kind of low ends, and so that was what helped us help move us toward the Thiessen polygon, and then what we did was we rerun this analysis, and we had a, a much higher N using those different sampling units. But, but the change point is just a place to sort of flag that, yep, there's something going on here, and you can decouple it from things like tributaries, if that's what you're asking about, and, um, and then you can go back in and run something like a randomization test to say, is it actually correlating at all to or being driven by a, a tributary? Great. Somebody else had the uh, same question, so we you got them both in. Oh, great. One slide. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I'm just going to open it up again to folks on the phone. If you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself by pressing star six. This is John Sanderson. Um, I'm a colleague of Meg's and a co-author on this paper as well. Um, and I first want to say, Meg, nice work. I'm I'm actually right nearby, Meg, but I'm not in the same room. I've been watching it uh, online here. And uh, I, Meg, I think you did a great job presenting this complicated work. Um, I wanted to put a point on the question that uh, was asked about what are the implications of this work. And I just wanted to share um, a little anecdote of mine from some time I've spent on the Dolores River, um, where you know there's been restoration work going on on the Dolores since um, 2008, 2009, uh, and an equally or similarly long time on the main stem of the Colorado in this region. And what we know about this restoration work is that it is a ton of work. It's very expensive. It's labor intensive. Um, and if you're doing things like planting cottonwoods, then um, it's, it's expensive to plant them, and a lot of them die. And so it's a low probability endeavor. And the, the point being that um, if you're going to be investing all these resources into restoration of these riparian ecosystems that have been adversely impacted by peak flow modification, you want to do it as thoughtfully as you possibly can and uh, direct those resources as strategically as you can. And one, uh, one thing I see in this work that was uh, where the, the hypothesis of, for example, uh, greater proportions of cottonwood near tributary junctions on the Dolores, what that tells me, and Meg said this earlier, so I'm just putting a, a finer point on it, that if we're going to spend time planting cottonwoods to try to reestablish patches of cottonwood habitat, we, we want to move away from the tributary junctions because the tributary junctions have these processes in place where through some mechanism that we didn't weren't able to completely elucidate, through some mechanism those tributaries are um, making up for the fact that the peak flows on the main stem have been compromised. And they're allowing um, greater cover of, of um, 
in this case, cottonwood, but then also more diversity in the types of cottonwood that are present uh, in, at those tributary junctions or near them within a few hundred meters, as, Trib, as uh, Meg showed. So if we're going to spend time and effort trying to recreate additional cottonwood patches under the assumption that there will be fewer created through natural processes, then we want to direct that away from the tributary junctions to where the main stem might have been supporting them um, historically or naturally, but the main stem can no longer support that establishment of cottonwood. Be happy to answer any questions about that. But for me, in all this work, that's the, 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 the primary takeaway that I get is that the tributary junctions, in terms of the diversity of habitats that are present there and the diversity of the geomorphic surfaces, are, are actually doing, they're, they're making up for some of that loss of the peak flow on the main stem. So in that sense, they're kind of doing okay, and we should really consider moving uh, the expensive restoration work to other places. Thanks, John. And uh, that was a great response. Um, Got to note that that's exactly what um, Kevin was getting to with his question, so thank you. Yeah, I think one other note that I just want to add to that, Mary, is that the degree of regulation on the main stem seems to make a really big difference, too. So um, John's point is, is exactly on, and then it's about, you know, what, what, how regulated is the main stem so that you can really see how much the, the tributaries are contributing. Thanks. So I'll put out one more call for questions by phone. Mute yourself by pressing star six. We don't have anything else in terms of being um, sent via chat. Meg, do you have that um, uh, the book information available? Oh, yeah. Um, I think Brian sent it to me, but I was just looking. You emailed it to me. <laughs> I could look at my email. Sure. <laughs> Oh, here. It's River Confluences, Tributaries in the Fluvial Network. Um, and it's Stephen Rice that's the lead author on that. Great. Thank you. Well, I think we can wrap it up. Um, we don't have any more questions, and it's even though we still have a couple minutes, if anybody wanted to get one in at the last minute. Um, but I think I'll just go ahead and wrap things up. If something comes in, I can quickly <laughs> field it to you guys. Um, Meg and you know, the co-authors, thanks so much for all your information, and uh, Meg also for presenting today. I'd also like to thank our audience for attending the webinar. I'll be sending everybody a link to the recording as well as the slides and then any other resources that Meg wants to provide. I could even put that book chapter too if people didn't get that, as well as Meg's contact information. And hopefully I'll get that out to everybody next week. Thanks, so, Mary. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, thanks so much, Meg, for taking the time. And um, really appreciate um, everybody's effort in um, doing the study and communicating the information to our audience. Great. All right, well, goodbye, everybody, and enjoy your day.